evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for watching Business of Design Week 2020. I am Michi Lee, and we are broadcasting live on Few TV6 and live streaming globally. Now, please join me in welcoming Ms. Betty Ng, who is the founder and creative director at Collective, with offices in Hong Kong, New York, and Madrid. She'll be moderating our discussion tonight, Design, Culture, and Creativity for Future Cities, and we'll be examining the ways in which culture can thrive through innovation and technology. Joining Betty are Susie Aneta and Stanley Wong. Welcome. Hello, everyone, and welcome to BODW 2020. It is obviously a very challenging moment for the world, yet at the same time, the challenges posted to all of us resulted in many innovative and courageous ideas. For instance, for BODW to continue this annual sharing on design insights, and this is the first time ever for BODW to broadcast live on VIEW TV. It is indeed extremely exciting, but also very humbling for myself also to see how everyone is working out the best way to move positively forward together. I'm Betty. I'm an architect who has been practicing in the Netherlands and currently based in Hong Kong, co-running an architecture studio with my three other directors internationally. I'll be your moderator today, in which we will also be listening to a panel from around the world. They will share insights on creative leadership and what it can mean for our near future particularly on resilience, on journalism, on design, and on social values. I have with me here in person today, Stanley Wong, winner of DFA World's Outstanding Chinese Designer. Welcome, Stanley. And Susie Anata. She's the editor-in-chief of Design Anthology. Online from the UK, we have founder and editor-in-chief, Marcus Fairs from Dinzine. Right there. Hello, Marcus. Thanks for tuning in. And then we also have Martha, Martha Thorne from Madrid, who's currently the Dean of IE University Architecture School, and she's the Executive Director of Prisca Price of Architecture. Thank you, Martha. How are you in Madrid? <laughs> Great, thank you. So let us welcome Martha. She will spearhead her sharing on the role of Design for Resilience. Thank you, Martha. Thank you. It's such, a, it's such a pleasure to be joining the Business of Design Week and accompanying you from Madrid. Design for Resilience seeks to embody the idea of not being defeated or having to be put on pause when we're faced with a challenge. It also means being prepared so that we can bounce back more quickly when facing a difficult situ situation, whether it's personally or as a city or our global community, as we see now with COVID-19. I think this pandemic, as you mentioned, has touched each and every one of us in some way. It's forced our institutions, our companies, our schools to take immediate action in response to this crisis situation. It's also affected policies, international relationships, and, and governments and organizations as they try to set paths that will help us see our way forward. I just have to say that I'm very grateful to my friends in Hong Kong and China because when um, uh, COVID hit here in Madrid, we didn't have face masks and the outpouring of friendship and concern uh, by sending the needed supplies was greatly appreciated. I'll never forget it. My own school sprung into action when we began uh, using our Fab Lab to fabricate usable, reusable face shields as headbands for the hospitals and clinics in our area. Um, those gestures reminded me we need to be prepared and how much we need designers and design solutions for pressing situations. Are there any solutions that we can learn from COVID? I think there are. The first one I would say is that we need to the, abandon the idea of one space and one function for our buildings and our cities. 
COVID teaches us that design responses are much more democratic when necessity demands speed. We've seen individuals forced to take steps quickly and to adapt and to implement ideas to modify their environments. And finally, COVID has shown us that those with an entrepreneurial mindset can see in this big challenge opportunities for new initiatives and new ways of doing things. I'd just like to share a few examples that have taken place in response to COVID, but I hope they will stay long after we've controlled the disease. The ideas that I show, some of them are by professional designers, but other ones are, other ones are uh, undertaken just in an ad hoc way. And they indicate to me the great opportunities and the great need for professionals to become involved with communities and cities and propose ideas that will thoughtfully and beautifully make our communities healthier, more beautiful, more livable, and more enjoyable. Of course, we find many empty spaces that are blocked to promote social distancing. And in the case of Priestman Good, they've shown us how some of these spaces can be adapted to new uses. Expanding this idea, if we think of our city streets, well, when we widen sidewalks, we can provide multifunctional space for relaxing, walking, eating, and even promote sustainability in terms of permeable pavements and more vegetation. Here's just a small example of a wider sidewalk undertaken in a more ad hoc way. Um, which is to allow parents who are waiting for their children to come out of elementary school to do it in a safe and protected way. And our streets, which take up the majority of public space in many of our cities, well, we can transform them on certain days and times, and they become spaces for play, exercise, and athletics. Madrid City Hall, as many cities, is allowing the temporary occupation of parts of street to expand cafes and restaurants to the outdoors. We are fortunate to have a good climate in Madrid, and you probably know we like to eat and drink with friends, so this transformation is especially relevant for us. And uh, it's happened across many, many cities and on rooftops, without a doubt. In many cities, the retail sector has suffered greatly. Those owning or renting buildings have been faced with diff difficult situations to pay the bills during COVID. This is one example of a woman in Philadelphia who has rented her space on a temporary basis for days or weeks to pop up stores, helping both merchants and herself pay the rent. And certainly outdoor points of sale are not new. But having a, a temporary uh, um, vehicle for buying, for an alternative to buying just online, but keeping us in contact with our clients and our communities is another way to expand retail. Um, even after COVID, um, I, I don't know about you, but um, we're trying to make certain activities more comfortable. And I wish I had a place close to home where I could, uh, where I could have a micro station for co-working. And this seems like a simple solution that we could, we could use. And social distancing. That's something that's very important during the time of COVID. And perhaps these ideas for uh, organizing people, not just during COVID, but afterwards, will be able to be implemented. And as I mentioned, the mini, the micro spaces close to home would allow us not to just work and live and do everything from our place of residence, but it would give us the opportunity to see other people, to connect and do it just by walking a few steps from our homes. 
And finally, my last example is our cities ready for uh, anything. This is just a competition that was won by the Ark Ingalls Group to disaster proof the edge of Manhattan in the case of a hurricane, another one like Sandy or flooding. And not only is it a way through using nature, creative design and architecture to protect the city, but it's also a way that we can then provide amenities and other services. In other words, solving several problems at one time. In summary, I think we need to think, rethink traditional definitions of typology, zoning, districts, neighborhoods, and include concepts of needs, possibilities, and time. It's really the idea of breaking down the concept of one function, one space, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to open up new possibilities. We've also seen how certain urban services need to adapt quickly, such as our healthcare systems in many countries that were unable to cope with the enormous demand. More than ever, architects and designers are needed for strategically thinking about spaces to be flexible, adaptable for changing need. COVID has shown us that those with an entrepreneurial mindset who can see these big, in these big challenges who can see opportunities for new initiatives, new businesses, new ways of doing things will be the most successful and the most sought after in the long run to make our environments livable, enjoyable, beautiful, not only short term, but also medium and long term. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Martha. Thank you for being with us even in Madrid. I uh, really appreciate that. And I love that picture you have shown in the Mecca. Such a touching picture at the same time. Um, well, I would love to kind of bring forth this question you know, to the panel also uh, about what have really uh, impressed you um, so far you know, during COVID, what kind of invention or responses from people all over the world. I, I can share something for myself first. Um, maybe something more lighthearted, um, the fashion world. I recently saw this fashion show uh, in Milan uh, by this brand called Sune. Um, they created this fashion show in, in an empty swimming pool, a gigantic Olympic-sized empty swimming pool. And they created these dots for social distancing. So they have an audience standing on these dots and have uh, their crew, the fashion crew, walking around it. Um, it was also in a rainy day. So everything that was supposed to be um, extremely practical because of social distancing becomes something very poetic. And it also created a very different scenario, uh, new ways of thinking to do something that is um, repetitive in a way. Every year they have this fashion week. Uh, I was very impressed. And uh, I wonder whether Susie or Stanley um, or even Marcus, you have observed anything um, in the last year in 2020 that you think is worth talking about, like that kind of uh, entrepreneurship uh, uh, spirit that people think of other ways to deal with this difficult livelihood. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I think we've all observed a lot of changes in each of our cities. Uh, I think um, I'm probably going to allude to this maybe in more detail when I say my words later, but um, not so much from an entrepreneurial point of view, but I think maybe just the way that people are reclaiming the streets in different cities around the world. And obviously Martha alluded to that a little bit um, in her home city and, and some of the other cities that she spoke about. I think that's been a really interesting thing to observe, particularly in Hong Kong. Uh, and I, I'm quite keen to see how much of that informal uh, adaptive reuse of streets will continue post COVID. Totally true. Uh, I have a few friends in New York, uh, still are designing for restaurants to, to move their kind of uh, eatery outside at parking spaces, exactly like the picture that Martha show in Madrid. It seems like a lot of Western cities are responding in that way. A little difficult in Hong Kong too, to start that, we're very dense. Stanley, would you have some um, things to share about your view on what have been the most impressive thing you have encountered, um, very inventive during this kind of COVID time? Um, I think, like Marvel said, a flexibility, adapt adaptable kind of mind that definitely involving in not only designers, also in general public. I mean, how to live life better uh, out of those hurdles and difficulties. I mean, I mean creativity not only a, a ownership only for designer. I would say for, for, for everyone to just think ahead 
to solve the problem or live life better in, 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 in the boundary of in front of us. Yes. Well, talking about living a better life, Hong Kong is 78% green, and we have all flock to, the, to nature. Uh, that's probably the only way we can spend our time right now. Uh, well, without further ado, I would love to invite Marcus, um, co uh, founder and editor-in-chief of Dinzine, to share some of his insights on journalism. Thank you, Marcus. Okay, cool. Do I have to, what do I have to do to share the screen? Do I have to click the screen icon? Yes, the screen is on. Oh, there we are. Okay, yes, so. Yes, thank you. Okay, so yeah, I'm a journalist I'm based in London, founder and editor in chief of Design, the online architecture and design magazine, which hopefully you all know. It's, uh, we cover architecture, interiors, and design. Um, this is our office in London, or this was our office in London this time last year. And of course, now it looks like this same office, no people. I'm actually broadcasting from the office today. And there's about three people here. I'm going to send, show two sets of images. One is how we saw the pandemic affect the world of architectural design through the stories we published on Design. And then in the second half, I'm going to show how the city around me in London has responded to coronavirus. So a professional take and a personal take. We first became aware of this thing called coronavirus, as did everyone else uh, around February time. And the first story that we published that really had a big impact on our readers was this German artist, Max Siedentopf, did a series of images showing people improvising face masks. This caused a, a huge outcry because, first of all, people thought it was uh, racist. They were, he thought he was taking the, the mickey out of, of the people that were impacted by the virus. And of course, this was at a time in the West where we hadn't quite um, experienced the, the trauma of the pandemic. But it certainly put it on everyone's radar that there was this thing happening in the world and, and it kind of the, the wave of the impact of that was spreading around the world. There was such a backlash against this artist that he then apologized to our readers for the, for the, the, the hurt he had caused. And this was, of course, at a time when in the West, we, nobody was wearing masks. We realized then in, towards the end of February that this, even though we were still not being impacted personally by this, that the world around us had changed. And the, the big landmark announcement, 23rd of, 25th of February, was that Salone del Mobile in Milan, the biggest design and, and furniture fair in the world, was being pushed back to June, to June because of the pandemic, which threw the whole sector into a panic, including Design, because so much of our business model is based on going to these kind of fairs. But at the same time, we saw improvisation and entrepreneurialism from designers throwing up often fantastical and completely impractical solutions to the pandemic, but it really gave people a whole new avenue of creative exploration. Sun Dayong designed these or proposed these kind of pods that you slip over your body so you can walk around in them. And also, as Martha mentioned just now, the kind of hacking uh, ethos became huge when people, the design community and the architecture community rallied around to help hospitals to hack face masks and face shields and things like that. These became like huge stories, loads of our readers wanting to find out how they could, how they could help. There was a real kind of social impulse to help people came forward through the creative community. The most popular story Design's ever published went live on the 9th of March when trend forecaster Lee Edelcourt, writing to me from Cape Town where she was stuck after not being able to get home after a conference, talked about coronavirus offering a blank page for a new beginning. So this was a sort of philosophical, the beginning of a philosophical response to the pandemic, creative people starting to think about using this as a springboard into a potential new world. And almost romanticizing um, the, the way that we could reinvent society, industry, get rid of pollution, and so on and so forth. Another phenomenon, of course, was the virtual became central to everyone's lives. This is just one example. The Frank Lloyd Wright um, charity started to offer virtual tours of all his buildings because people couldn't go to them in the real world, of course. And this, this was a, uh, something that I think is going to become like really important to all of our lives as the virtual, we use the pandemic as, a, as a, a way of exploring virtual experiences instead of real life ones. 
And then, of course, the, the whole accessorization, the PPE, became something desirable. Designers started to think of ways of turning it into something like lifestyle accessories. Um, Airbnb announced on the 23rd of June that travel as we knew it is over. I think we already knew that at that point, but suddenly the idea of, of a life without getting on a plane every week became, became a reality, quite a, a positive reality in many ways for lots of us who spent our lives jetting around the world. And then finally, on the 13th of October, Norman Foster was asked, is COVID-19 going to change our cities? The answer is no, he said. The next set of images of pictures I've taken myself and put on my Instagram account, um, which I think point to the fact that Norman's got it wrong. Nearly all of these pictures were taken within a few hundred meters of my home because that became my landscape, of course. And of course, this was the, the, the first response. I had to set up a little video studio at home to broadcast to our audience. Um, I was walking back from the office last night and I saw <laughs> Every third house, more or less, had a home office set up in the bay window. 150, 100 years ago, all of these houses in my neighborhood, which is Victorian, would have had sewing machines in the bay window so that people could benefit from the light to mend their clothes and so on and so forth. Now they've become offices and broadcast studios. That's one change. Um, a huge increase in the number of people cycling around London. Uh, in fact, the biggest um, downside uh, that hits us personally in our community is theft of bicycles. It's become a huge industry of people stealing bikes and selling them um, on, on websites and in street markets. On um, uh, contrast to that, public transport use has collapsed. So suddenly traveling on a bus is like a really lonely and new experience. But in, at the same time, people have taken to the streets and I would say that the authorities in the UK have been very backwards and slow in terms of responding to the pandemic, but Soho in the center of London got it right and it became like a Mediterranean town over the summer. They closed the streets and people flocked to these restaurants. Um, everyone craved nature, but not everyone can get to nature. So London's parks became a surrogate for the countryside and for the beach. Even the, the dirty river near me, which no one had ever thought of going in before and enjoying, it was, it was seen as a kind of conduit to take water to the, to the Thames as quickly as possible. It became like a Riviera with hundreds of people bathing, floating boats, taking their dogs there, picnicking, people really changing the way they see the city. The Royal Ballet um, started to improvise performances on the canal side. They were using this building in the background as, as a rehearsal space, and they decided to start rehearsing on the canal, and then it suddenly became this phenomenon of people turning up to watch ballet performances on the canal until the police came and shut it down, unfortunately. Um, this is a, a sculpture in my local park. It's, it's in honor of Mary Wollstonecross, who, Croft, who was considered the founder of, of feminism, and it was such a controversial thing. People ranting in, in the newspapers, ranting on blogs about this sculpture, but it's in the open air. So people found a way to appreciate and discuss art in a, in a new kind of way in public. The, the, the kind of hatch, the, the hole in the wall became the new way we consumed food and drink, ordering things from someone through a window. The, the side effect of this was a whole new culture of, of trash, of people eating in the streets. Um, this was during lockdown, which has just ended, um, a pub, people going to the pub, even though the pub's not open and hanging out in the streets. And this is a beautiful picture I took the other night by the canal of a couple having a picnic at night in, in November. Um, and here's a restaurant preparing all its takeaway orders for the for, the, for the, the people who are ordering from home. So basically the picture I'm painting here is of not of designers redesigning the city and not of governments redesigning the city, but of people improvising and redesigning their lives around the restrictions that have been imposed on them. Thank you so much, Marcus. It's really nice to see all these slides, uh, really seeing the city through your lens. Thank you so much for showing, showing it to us. It's, it's actually rather personal, I realized. Uh, speaking about journalism, um, you know, throughout 2020, I always feel like 
I finally realized uh, how I'm taking it for granted that I can just go online and read about news, uh, while there are actually reporters uh, being outside, risking their lives, trying to uh, review what's happening all over the world. And um, despite Dinsin, it's an online publication, uh, but seeing your pictures of your office full of people and then your office empty, um, it does make me think, um, well, no, pardon my ignorance, because I've never worked in the journalism industry, um, but it does make me think journalism must be one of the most agile industry. Um, you know, being able to move and adapt to situation, um, because I have also seen a lot of journalists running around, flying around the world, bringing their laptop, talking to people. I just wonder whether, Marcus, you can share a little bit on how it has really changed the way that you guys have been working. Does it change it? Or do you think um, this is something that is mostly adaptable uh, for the future for you guys uh, as online journalists? Well, first of all, from a pure informational point of view, the, the coronavirus pandemic is one of the, the it's probably the biggest stories most of my team have ever covered. I mean, I was a journalist when 9-11 happened. That was a huge deal and, and you know, kept us, kept us busy for weeks and months processing what this meant for architecture in the city. But the pandemic is something we've all lived through personally. Uh, our audience grew 20% overnight when the pandemic hit because people were craving information. They wanted to know what was going on, but they also wanted entertaining. They also wanted to be uh, feel a part of a community because they were all isolated at home. So the, the, the information provision aspect of journalism became super, super important. We were a lifeline to people. We were their community. We were their social life when they couldn't do anything else. It put the business under an enormous amount of strain, but all businesses have to be flexible. And we've now figured out uh, ways of providing what our, our clients want through the virtual anyway. We were lucky that we were only a virtual platform in the first place. So that transition has been traumatic, but feasible. Thank you, Marcus. Susie, I, I also have a question for you because you also work in the publication, but it's not online, it's a physical book. And I wonder how it has actually changed, uh, have it changed how you guys work uh, in 2020? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, we actually do have a digital presence and we did do before COVID. Um, but I think we, like many media outlets, uh, were forced to, you know, this word pivot that's being used so much this year. I, th I think we were sort of, it maybe accelerated us trying to diversify more. And I think print has always been a big part of what we do. It's, it was all that we did to begin with. But it certainly has, uh, yeah, accelerated the process of us wanting to communicate to our audience across multiple platforms. Uh, and I think, you know, perhaps we took a different stance to Dezeen. You know, we're very different publications. Um, and so I guess for us, instead of focusing on COVID and the pandemic and, and reporting that as a story, I think we took the position fairly early on in the year, actually, that perhaps some of us were suffering from a bit of COVID fatigue and didn't really want to talk about it. And actually, we then took the stance that we would provide some sort of a relief from that. And so the stories that we were covering were perhaps uh, a bit more longer term and hopefully some kind of a respite from... Some of it is doom and gloom. Some of it is obviously very positive and there's been a lot of ingenuity that's come out of this year. But yeah, it's certainly been challenging. Certainly. Um, I always find online publication, for me, what catches me the most is actually the comment session. And obviously, Dinzine has vivid arguments on the comment sessions. And I always find it very interesting to read that. Um, but in contrary, um, you know, during COVID times, I started reading a lot more than usual. I order books. And I just want to know, on a lighter note, whether your subscription has increased. Because also your book is very beautiful. It's almost like receiving a gift. Uh, and I imagine, again, it's almost like a century receiving something, talking about beautiful items, and everyone's trapped at home. Well, thank you for that comment. That's nice to hear. Um, yeah, I think definitely subscriptions did go up, but obviously there was a period of time during the year where physically getting magazines out to newsstands and people getting outside of their house to buy them was very challenging. And I think um, perhaps a bit like Dezeen, we saw our digital traffic grow. 
Uh, and I think one of the ways in which we pivoted this year was to actually launch a podcast series. So that was kind of our contribution to the more of the moment conversations. So I think our audience has grown, but it's perhaps diversified a bit more, which is a result of what's happened. That's actually great news. Yeah. Marcus, thank you so much. Uh, I'm aware that you have um, engagement to, to head to, and you will have to leave us at this moment. Um, we really thank yeah, you so much. No worries. To, thank you so much to be here, and it was really nice to see uh, London through your eyes. Um, so I will actually move on to um, getting Susie on board uh, to share about her uh, feelings on design. Thank you. Thanks, Betty. So, yeah, I just wanted to share some personal thoughts, actually, from this year. Um, as the editor-in-chief of Design Anthology, I've learnt a lot this year through the imagery, uh, the editorial coverage, and, as I just mentioned, the podcast conversations that we've published uh, about how we live in our cities and spaces and how that may have changed during COVID-19 and perhaps some of the lessons that we can take with us from this into the future. So I'm, I'm sure that we've all seen the photos of the empty streets of some of the world's largest cities, including London, New York, Tokyo, and, and our home city, Hong Kong, deserted as our public and social lives are put on hold, hopefully temporarily. Once dynamic, bustling cities, now disturbingly quiet and deserted. And during the months that followed, many of us began to see views of our cities like never before, afforded to us sans air pollution. We've seen some urban areas become overgrown and even animals returning to the city. Here in Hong Kong, there was a video of some wild hogs bathing in a fountain outside of the iconic Bank of China building that went viral online, very amusing for all of us. In some cities, we've seen busy, uh, formerly busy arterial roads become pedestrianised, uh, as Martha showed, and as extensions of public space used for dining, entertainment and play, in the realisation that perhaps being outside was safer than being locked up indoors. And in some places, planning officials are taking this as a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to actually permanently redraw the streetscape by expanding walking paths and bike, bike lanes. Closer to home, while public parks, beaches and gyms were closed, I think uh, Betty mentioned before, it's become an opportunity for us to, here in Hong Kong to enjoy the hiking trails, which seem much more populated than even some of the more denser neighbourhoods in Hong Kong. Um, while we've all been grounded here in the SAR's relatively confined borders, no doubt all of us are noticing and appreciating new noises and new rhythms of life wherever we reside. The question remains as to whether cars will continue to rule the urban streetscape when we return to a new normal, whatever that might be. Um, I can only think that if only Jane Jacobs were still here with us that she'd surely have a few wise words to share with us all. Uh, closer to home, a recent conversation that I had with Hong Kong architect William Lim of CL3 for a podcast episode that we recorded. Um, it was a timely reminder of the proliferation of curtain wall facades in many modern cities, including here in Hong Kong, and the subsequent lack of openable windows. And I think our basic human need for fresh air and ventilation could not be any more obvious now than before. Uh, and, and what of office towers and places of work? The technology required to work more flexibly is not new. Um, will dull, uninspired workplaces become a thing of the past? And how will we balance the basic human need for interaction in the workplace with the balance or with the planet's need for fewer cars on the road each day? not to mention planes in the sky. So many of my conversations with previously peripatetic designers have included their thoughts on just how unnecessary their travel schedules were before and how perhaps video conferencing is here to stay. For those of us lucky enough to have a permanent roof over our head, so many of us have spent an inordinate amount of time in our own homes these last few months. 
And I, like many others, am starting to notice details like never before, including how the light falls across a wall at a particular time of the day, the feel of the floor underneath my bare feet, the chirp of nearby, uh, well, the chirping of nearby nesting birds, and the smell of an incoming rainstorm, and certainly an increased appreciation for the tactility of the objects that I love and that I use on a daily basis. I live alone, and yet my dining table has become the venue for a melting pot of activities, including morning coffee, dinner, reading, and painting. Uh, and so many of my friends across the world have seen theirs become a place to work, to eat, to homeschool, and to do craft. And I think our living spaces are all doing double time and double duty, and those that win are spaces that are flexible. My bedroom, for example, is also where I do my yoga in the morning. I think the objects that we surround ourselves with have increased importance, and I take solace in anything that's handmade and that shows history and human touch. I think they heighten my sense of enjoyment when I'm using that object, and some days that's as close as it gets to other human interaction. I'm also torn between the feel of something that's hefty and signals a certain level of quality, and now, of course, with a newfound fear and uh, cause to think about sanitation, the ability to actually not touch anything at all. So I think no doubt we'll see a wave of new technology in the home and in the workplace in the coming months and years ahead. My final words are that I'm, I'm hopeful that this has been and continues to be a big enough jolt to all of us, to all of mankind, to realise that we need to make changes about how we plan our cities, how we design our buildings, how we create products, and actually, in fact, how we live our lives. Thank you, Susie. That was really calming, actually. <laughs> Thank you. It's really nice to see all these um, beautiful images you, you put forth. And um, it's, it's very calming indeed. Like, I feel really good right now. <laughs> um, but indeed, I was, I was caught by something you mentioned, uh, you know, the word new normal, that we all use it as if it's the most normal thing in the world right now. And um, I can't help but also uh, pay attention to your description of your home, um, how it has become a flexible space. It, basically, it's a melting pot of everything you mentioned. And um, I would like to share a little bit of my own experience in terms of flexibility. Um, of course, as an architect, I've always kind of looked into how our space can be flexible, um, how my home can become my exercise gym, and now and also a meeting room. Um, but I have been teaching through Zoom for the whole semester with 11 students. And that to me is shocking because it is the new normal. And it becomes the new normal and it becomes so normal that now I'm so used to it that I start to rethink whether it does make sense for visiting professors to fly all the way across the country in order to teach once every month. Um, I guess that's the question also I would like to pose to Martha. Uh, as an educator. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, IE University has been quite a forefront runner on online teaching. And it was almost kind of already a norm among the school before the pandemic hit. Um, I wonder whether um, the whole kind of uh, COVID situation in Spain, which has been quite intense for a while, um, have, have, have it changed the way that you guys run education program? Yes, th thank you so much for that uh, question. I, I think COVID for all of us, what it did is m maybe accelerated the path that we were going down and, um, and gave us this heightened awareness of what's around us. So you're right that IE University has been uh, uh, in the forefront of online learning or blended learning for more than a decade, for about two decades now. And even in architecture, teaching design studio online is not foreign to us. What I think the big change with COVID uh, that I see is that we have understood that people learn in different ways, subject matters, have uh, different pedagogies that can be more effective or less effective. 
and not one size fits all. So I, I think that we do, uh, we are back on campus, um, but we have a hybrid model, realizing that some students can't join us. They are more than welcome to connect online in real time. Um, we've had to install a lot of technology and health protocols, but I think the lesson that we've learned is that there are new technologies, there are ways of teaching that can allow students to be more self-paced, to allow students to work with each other rather than focusing just on, on the professor, and that we can develop learning materials to complement, not to be the same thing as classroom, not to substitute it, but rather to complement it. So I think the big change at IE is what we call liquid learning, which means responding to differences and looking for different ways to respond to, to different needs. Thank you, Martha. Um, liquid learning, that's a really, really nice description, actually. Um, I mean, liquid basically means fluidity, flexibility. And I would like to bring this question back to, to Susie again um, in terms of Asian design. Uh, we all know that in Asia, uh, the way that we counteract COVID has been relatively effective. And, uh, and you have started a podcast. Uh, would you mind to share with us, um, probably throughout the podcast, well, you did talk about uh, what William mentioned, which is really great, because we do need operable windows. Um, have you actually gained any other insights through your podcast from the kind of Asian, um, Asia Pacific area designers that you have spoke to? Yeah, that's a good question. I think probably um, one of the most common things that is sort of spoken about is actually just, um, I think, how easier it has been for design studios in this part of the world to transition to working remotely. Uh, I think in, in other parts of the world, perhaps, it was a bit of a shock. Um, and I know that depending on what kind of design discipline we're talking about, um, the software that's required is obviously very different. So having a, a whole team of architects working on very heavy software like AutoCAD or other programs is um, not always possible to do from home. But I've been really quite pleasantly surprised by the lack of interruption. Um, and I think also the other thing is just sort of people... Uh, knowing that change needs to happen and, and just making it happen. I think that's probably one of the, the key things about the human spirit is just getting on with things, right? And designers are, are really good at adapting, I think. so. It's, it's very true. Um, I would like to give credit to my team also. We have been working from home for six months in 2020 and everything operates perfectly well. Well, talking about fluidity, may I introduce Stanley Wong? probably one of the most fluid Chinese designer uh, I've ever met. And uh, Stanny will be sharing some of his insights on brand values versus social values. Thank okay. you, Stanny. Hi. Uh, I've been asked many, many times last year, Stanny, what's creativity, what's design beyond 2020? Means after the COVID-19. Um, Yes, I got two status. Uh, Stanley is on the commercial commission work. Another mountain man is my another role on the art and personal work. Yes, you're right. I got many, many slashes role from designers, brand consultants. Sometimes I do space and commercial job. And also I do personal work on making my own voices. And also I do education, also a media person too. Uh, <laughs> I've been long here, and 40 years, four decades for Hong Kong market, uh, exactly two decades, very concentrate on China market at the same time. Uh, so I've been asked, Stanley, what's a livable city? I, I know the whole conference this year also back to livability of the city. We talk about before COVID-19, at the same time we think ahead, what's in the future, what does it mean by livability? A livable city. Of course, it's measured by a lot of different, different angles, the technology, medical, creativity. And the last line here, you see this line, social environmental sustainability. Also, it's a very hot topic or more uh, focused that last decade that we, 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 we concern. And I'm a communicator or do communication brand 
making friend voices, then values in my or voices from the brand, then I, I that's my focus, my, my, my professional. So this, this pictures show you that's how China last 20 years, very into fashion and because they're coming economically rich and then they have enjoyed a lot of imported Western lifestyle. But at the same time, since then, I last 20 years, I worked with a local brand from China called Exception. We are not along that trend. We are state where it's to the Asian aesthetic and also as a brand communicator, I added values on Asian values, also some philosophical kind of feeling, uh, social value, humanity. Humanity is a, a, also there's an important uh, angle that I, I concern involving in creativity. So we build uh, a lot of uh, environmental re recycling material in the interior. This is like a social project work with the kids in the in the in the far country, and then uh, love, women's in society. This uh, environmental concern. Uh, so this is very unusual kind of twenty twenty fashion brand, but uh, where we keep going with those values at the same time, same topic. Uh, we we open a retail store, a big bookstore retail uh, on cultural products in southern Guangzhou called Fong So. And also, we like to bring in um, another kind of different lifestyle to the city, southern Guangzhou and then Chengdu. And it's back to the inner value, not kind of materialistic kind of direction. And it, it does change the city, to particularly younger generation, we're curating different shows, um, art projects. Um, this picture show you how the China, also similar to Hong Kong, property advertising, all the luxury gross that you're laughing now, <laughs> and the very Western expensive kind of target that's my dream, my home, my, my life, basically. So uh, in, in contrast, I work with a, 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 a Xinjin, a, a China Xinjin property clan that called Upper Hills. Then we totally away from that. We, uh, the slogan is called Upper Living, Sang 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 Wood, is back to minor, a kind of mindful inner value. That's very, of course, how we build the uh, showroom or related to nature uh, against things, those shiny chandelier things, no chandelier in the, in the in showroom. It, it, it make a, a big uh, controversial kind of uh, uh, reaction in, in, in the market, but at the same time, it gained a lot of uh, empathy or the, uh, from the user at the end, how we do the aesthetic uh, 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 lifestyle to, to, to the audience from Full Yi, Yi Magazine. Uh, also, we built a sculpture for Muji Hotel in, in, the, in the premises like that. Uh, this one, this photo show you how the Hong Kong upper market shopping mall, uh, Michelin staff, uh, in our shopping mall, uh, can, again, those are uh, uh, expensive Western lifestyle. This is how we see shopping mall. Uh, luckily, in uh, 2016, I worked with IFC in Hong Kong that the rebranding exercise is not about that. It's I convinced them to just back to the basic life that we are sharing. Life is beautiful is the, the, the slogan of the platform. We, we are uh, shooting a, uh, a, a film on cinema, on TV, and then we talk about uh, uh, homecoming is beautiful. Uh, we talk about health is beautiful, and season, four seasons is beautiful. So again, definitely it's not similar type of uh, shopping mall advertising you've seen normally. Uh, the last one I just want to show you is the Cafe de Coral. This is leading fast food train in Hong Kong, the oldest one actually. You can see it, their 
their ambience and interiors, also hanging those Eiffel Tower pictures, uh, Brooklyn Bridge, again, Western. So because it's a local brand, when, we, they, when they do the rebranding, I, I convinced them uh, three or four years ago that back to Hong Kong. Then also, we, t we tell the Hong Kong story to cut in Hong Kong into 18 districts, just back to your neighborhood, back to your around this, the, the, uh, this area around you. So we, we go out 18 times to shoot all pictures of different, 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 uh, for different people. Again, humanity is also reflected in also in this uh, project. So at the end, we bring those images back to the store. Again, this is uh, another big uh, differences uh, when they put up the Eiffel Tower versus this Hong Kong neighborhood pictures. So I think uh, quickly I show you those projects among the last 20 years that lead to people asking, Sandy, what's next then? So COVID-19 definitely is a tragedy, but I, think, I still think there's inspiration here. And some keywords people all talk about the new normal, we reset, reboot, or oh, what's, ne what's the new future like? I think to my experience, I think the, the more core crucial important word is the new social value or what's the new belief. To, to end my presentation, I think this calligraphy work is my, from my teacher. I hang my on the wall uh, for 20 years and uh, that is from an ancient uh, China philosopher, Lo Zi. These two words is Ji Ji, know when to stop. When you know when you stop that, you run no angel, danger. This is a very, very, I think these two words is exactly, it's very, very, very useful. Let us think what's next, what's the future, what we should do. Thank you. Thank you, Stanny. Thank you. Um, I think it will, you will be the perfect person for me to ask about Asianness. If I might share some of my feeling about this word, um, I feel like there is always this uh, incredible power of assimilation that the Asians designer have. Um, for example, um, the Japanese with Japanese curry. Mm -hmm. They basically reappropriated what curry is and made their own kind of curry and it becomes extremely popular and their own genre in itself. The Hong Kong milk tea from the British. And um, if I might put forth um, the idea of Asianness to me, um, it's, it's not necessarily about making something new, but it's about absorbing, assimilating, digesting, and creating something in its own standing. Um, I don't believe necessarily in the dichotomy, the West versus the East, or the East versus the West. And Stanley, I would like to ask, do you have any projects that you have done that you feel like you have successfully assimilated both worlds? Uh, talk about Asian. Of course, you can see my words, a lot of localness, uh, local culture there. Um, I think in, in Asia, from our graphic design circle, there is, uh, there's a, one master from, from Korea called Mr. Ang Sang Su. He's also an a educator and, 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 and designer. And Japanese guy, he's a Muji artistic director, uh, Mr. Uh, Kenya Hara. Three of us very serious about what the future of Asian creativity. We don't know the answer, but we know that definitely we have kind of synergy, a dialogue, and kind of motivate each other, become a strong force, keep going in, in front of the Western world or the whole world. Then we start uh, 2019, gather designers from different Asian countries, cities, sit down to the first conversation. But too bad this year we stopped because the COVID-19, we can't get together. Then that is it for a long future, that definite, that we would we like to have more dialogue to see what the similarity yet different in a kind of a uniqueness yeah. can be go forward. Yeah, 
Kenya Hara is definitely one, one of the heroes in assimilating both worlds together. Martha, if I might impose a little bit, <laughs> um, I would like to see whether you do have some feelings, observation. Uh, you know, being in Europe, um, but yourself American, um, being so into the architecture world as the executive director of Prisca Prize, um, how do you feel about um, the rise of Asian designers? Oh, that, that's a huge question. Yes, it's sorry. a very interesting <laughs> one. Um, and and I, I think that just as we talk about Latin America, um, probably talking about Asia is not one culture, it's not one uh, group. Um, I think that Japanese design in the field of architecture um, in the second half of the, the 20th century to the present has always been prominent. I think it has to do with publications. It may also have to do with the tech, uh, tactile quality of their construction, etc. cetera. I, I think that what I see in, in terms of Asian countries that maybe are less well known in the West is uh, incredible energy. And this is something that I hope that I've been able to do in my role as executive director at the Pritzker Prize, which is reach out to places that are probably less well known by myself and jury members and try to gather information. And I'm very thankful to publications, online publications, but, but also just the ability to send an email to people and ask their opinion that technology allows us. So I would say, um, although we like to discover the unknown, it's uh, the energy and, and the uh, talent is percolating, it's there. It's more our shortcomings in not knowing than, than the fact that, uh, that it doesn't exist. It certainly exists. Thank you so much, Martha. Unfortunately, we only have one hour for this fabulous panel. And I would love to express to everyone our gratitude for you to join us this evening. And I definitely managed to take quite a few insights away. Uh, but please, don't miss our other session of BOBW. We still have two more days. And uh, the team has put together this really, really great program for everyone um, from all over the world. Uh, the idea of BODW is to really share design insights to the world and also bring them to Hong Kong. So here, I wish everyone very healthy and definitely stay very agile. Thank you for being with us tonight. We appreciate it very much. Goodbye.